A Thousand Deaths by Jack London Originally published in Black Cat Magazine, May 1899 Narrated by Tom Tresser I had been in the water about an hour, and cold, exhausted, with a terrible cramp in my right calf, it seemed as though my hour had come. Fruitlessly struggling against the strong ebb tide, I had beheld the maddening procession of the waterfront lights slip by, but now I gave up attempting to breast the stream and contented myself with the bitter thoughts of a wasted career now drawing to a close. It had been my luck to come of good English stock, but of parents whose account with the bankers far exceeded their knowledge of child nature and the rearing of children. While born with a silver spoon in my mouth, the blessed atmosphere of my home circle was to me unknown. My father, a very learned man and a celebrated antiquarian, gave no thought to his family, being constantly lost in the abstractions of his study, while my mother, noted far more for her good looks than her good sense, sated herself with the adulation of the society in which she was perpetually plunged. I went through the regular school and college routine of a boy of the English bourgeoisie, and as the years brought me increasing strength and passions, my parents suddenly became aware that I was possessed of an immortal soul and endeavoured to draw the curb. But it was too late. I perpetrated the wildest and most audacious folly, and was disowned by my people, ostracised by the society I had so long outraged, and with the thousand pounds my father gave me, with a declaration that he should neither see me again nor give me more, I took a first-class passage to Australia. Since then, my life had been one long peregrination, from the Orient to the Occident, from the Arctic to the Antarctic, to find myself at last, an able seaman at thirty, in the full vigour of my manhood, drowning in San Francisco Bay because of a disastrously successful attempt to desert my ship. My right leg was drawn up by the cramp, and I was suffering the keenest agony. A slight breeze stirred up a choppy sea, which washed into my mouth and down my throat, nor could I prevent it. Though I still contrived to keep afloat, it was merely mechanical, for I was rapidly becoming unconscious. I have a dim recollection of drifting past the sea wall, and of catching a glimpse of an upriver steamer's starboard light, then everything became a blank. I heard the low hum of insect life, and felt the balmy air of a spring morning fanning my cheek. Gradually it assumed a rhythmic flow, to whose soft pulsations my body seemed to respond. I floated on the gentle bosom of a summer sea, rising and falling with dreamy pleasure on each crooning wave. But the pulsations grew stronger, the humming louder, the waves larger, fiercer. I was dashed about on a stormy sea. A great agony fastened upon me. Brilliant, intermittent sparks of light flashed athwart my inner consciousness. In my ears there was the sound of many waters, then a sudden snapping of an intangible something, and I awoke. The scene of which I was protagonist was a curious one. A glance sufficed to inform me that I lay on the cabin floor of some gentleman's yacht in a most uncomfortable posture. On either side, grasping my arms and working them up and down like pump handles, were two peculiarly clad, dark-skinned creatures. Though conversant with most Aboriginal types, I could not conjecture their nationality. Some attachment had been fastened about my head, which connected my respiratory organs with a machine I shall next describe. My nostrils, however, had been closed, forcing me to breathe through my mouth. Foreshortened by the obliquity of my line of vision, I beheld two tubes similar to small hosing, but of different composition, 
which emerged from my mouth and went off at an acute angle from each other. The first came to an abrupt termination and lay on the floor beside me. The second traversed the floor in numerous coils, connecting with the apparatus I have promised to describe. In the days before my life had become tangential, I had dabbled not a little in science, and, conversant with the appurtenances and general paraphernalia of the laboratory, I appreciated the machine I now beheld. It was composed chiefly of glass, the construction being of that crude sort which is employed for experimentative purposes. A vessel of water was surrounded by an air chamber to which was fixed a vertical tube surmounted by a globe. In the centre of this was a vacuum gauge. The water in the tube moved upwards and downwards, creating alternate inhalations and exhalations which were in turn communicated to me through the hose. With this, and the aid of the men who pumped my arms so vigorously, had the process of breathing been artificially carried on, my chest rising and falling, and my lungs expanding and contracting, till nature could be persuaded to again take up her wonted labour. As I opened my eyes, the appliance about my head, nostrils and mouth was removed, Draining a stiff three fingers of brandy, I staggered to my feet to thank my preserver, and confronted my father. But long years of fellowship with danger had taught me self-control, and I waited to see if he would recognize me. Not so. He saw in me no more than a runaway sailor, and treated me accordingly. Leaving me to the care of the blackies, he fell to revising the notes he had made on my resuscitation. As I ate of the handsome fare served up to me, confusion began on deck, and from the chanties of the sailors and the rattling of blocks and tackles, I surmised that we were getting under way. What a lark! Off on a cruise with my recluse father into the wide Pacific! Little did I realise, as I laughed to myself, which side the joke was to be on. I, had I known, I would have plunged overboard and welcomed the dirty foxicle from which I had just escaped. I was not allowed on deck till we had sunk the Farallones and the last pilot boat. I appreciated this forethought on the part of my father, and made it a point to thank him heartily in my bluff seaman's manner. I could not suspect that he had his own ends in view, in thus keeping my presence secret to all save the crew. He told me briefly of my rescue by his sailors, assuring me that the obligation was on his side, as my appearance had been most opportune. He had constructed the apparatus for the vindication of a theory concerning certain biological phenomena, and had been waiting for an opportunity to use it. "'You have proved it beyond all doubt,' he said, then added with a sigh, "'but only in the small matter of drowning.' But, to take a reef in my yarn, he offered me an advance of two pounds on my previous wages to sail with him, and this I considered handsome, for he really did not need me. Contrary to my expectations, I did not join the sailor mess, for odd, being assigned to a comfortable stateroom and eating at the captain's table. He had perceived that I was no common sailor, and I resolved to take this chance for reinstating myself in his good graces. I wove a fictitious past to account for my education and present position, and did my best to come in touch with him. I was not long in disclosing a predilection for scientific pursuits, nor he in appreciating my aptitude. I became his assistant, with a corresponding increase in wages, and before long, as he grew confidential and expounded his theories, I was as enthusiastic as himself. The days flew quickly by, for I was deeply interested in my new studies, passing my waking hours in his well-stocked library, or listening to his plans and aiding him in his laboratory work. But we were forced to forego many enticing experiments, a rolling ship not being exactly the proper place for delicate or intricate work. 
He promised me, however, many delightful hours in the magnificent laboratory for which we were bound. He had taken possession of an uncharted South Sea island, as he said, and turned it into a scientific paradise. We had not been on the island long before I discovered the horrible mare's nest I had fallen into. But before I describe the strange things which came to pass, I must briefly outline the causes which culminated in as startling as an experience as ever fell to the lot of man. Late in life, my father had abandoned the musty charms of antiquity and succumbed to the more fascinating ones embraced under the general head of biology. Having been thoroughly grounded during his youth in the fundamentals, he rapidly explored all the higher branches as far as the scientific world had gone, and found himself on the no-man's land of the unknowable. It was his intention to pre-empt some of this unclaimed territory, and it was at this stage of investigations that we had been thrown together. Having a good brain, though I say it myself, I had mastered his speculations and methods of reasoning, becoming almost as mad as himself. But I should not say this. The marvellous results we afterwards obtained can only go to prove his sanity. I can but say that he was the most abnormal specimen of cold-blooded cruelty I have ever seen. After having penetrated the dual mysteries of physiology and psychology, his thought had led him to the verge of a great field for which, the better to explore, he began studies in higher organic chemistry, pathology, toxicology, and other sciences and sub-sciences rendered kindred as accessories to his speculative hypotheses. Starting from the proposition that a direct cause of the temporary and permanent arrest of vitality was due to the coagulation of certain elements and compounds in the protoplasm. He had isolated and subjected these various substances to innumerable experiments. Since the temporary arrest of vitality in an organism brought coma, and a permanent arrest, death, he held that by artificial means this coagulation of the protoplasm could be retarded, prevented, and even overcome in the extreme states of solidification. Or, to do away with the technical nomenclature, he argued that death, when not violent and in which none of the organs had suffered injury, was merely suspended vitality, and that, in such instances, life could be induced to resume its functions by the use of proper methods. This, then, was his idea to discover the method, and by practical experimentation prove the possibility of renewing vitality in a structure from which life had seemingly fled. Of course, he recognised the futility of such endeavour after decomposition had set in. He must have organisms which but the moment, the hour, or the day before had been quick with life. With me in a crude way, he had proved this theory. I was really drowned, really dead, when picked from the water of San Francisco Bay. But the vital spark had been renewed by means of his aerotherapeutical apparatus, as he called it. Now to his dark purpose concerning me. He first showed me how completely I was in his power. He had sent the yacht away for a year, retaining only his two blackies, who were utterly devoted to him. He then made an exhaustive review of his theory and outlined the method of proof he had adopted, concluding with a startling announcement that I was to be his subject. I had faced death and weighed my chances in many a desperate venture, but never in one of this nature. I can swear I am no coward, Yet this proposition of journeying back and forth across the borderland of death put the yellow fear upon me. I asked for time, which he granted, at the same time assuring me that but the one course was open. I must submit. Escape from the island was out of the question. 
escape by suicide was not to be entertained, though really preferable to what it seemed I must undergo. My only hope was to destroy my captors, but this latter was frustrated through the precautions taken by my father. I was subjected to a constant surveillance, even in my sleep being guarded by one or the other of the blacks. Having pleaded in vain, I announced and proved that I was his son. It was my last card, and I had played all my hopes upon it. But he was inexorable. He was not a father, but a scientific machine. I wonder yet how it ever came to pass that he married my mother or begat me, for there was not the slightest grain of emotion in his make-up. Reason was all in all to him nor could he understand such things as love or sympathy in others, except as petty weaknesses which should be overcome. So he informed me that in the beginning he had given me life, and who had better right to take it away than he? Such, he said, was not his desire. However, he merely wished to borrow it occasionally, promising to return it punctually at the appointed time. Of course, there was a liability of mishaps, but I could do no more than take the chances, since the affairs of men were full of such. The better to ensure success, he wished me to be in the best possible condition, so I was dieted and trained like a great athlete before a decisive contest. What could I do? If I had to undergo the peril, it were best to be in good shape. In my intervals of relaxation, he allowed me to assist in the arranging of the apparatus and in the various subsidiary experiments. The interest I took in all such operations can be imagined. I mastered the work as thoroughly as he, and often had the pleasure of seeing some of my suggestions or alterations put into effect. After such events, I would smile grimly conscious of officiating at my own funeral. He began by inaugurating a series of experiments in toxicology. When all was ready, I was killed by a stiff dope of strychnine and allowed to lie dead for some twenty hours. During that period, my body was dead, absolutely dead. All respiration and circulation ceased but the frightful part of it was that while the protoplasmic coagulation proceeded, I retained consciousness and was enabled to study it in all its ghastly details. The apparatus to bring me back to life was an airtight chamber fitted to receive my body. The mechanism was simple. A few valves, a rotary shaft and crank, and an electric motor when in operation, the interior atmosphere was alternately condenses and rarefied, thus communicating to my lungs an artificial respiration without the agency of the hosing previously used. Though my body was inert, and for all I knew, in the first stages of decomposition, I was cognizant of everything that transpired. I knew when they placed me in the chamber, and thought all my senses were quiescent, I was aware of hypodermic injections of a compound to react upon the coagulatory process. Then the chamber was closed, and the machinery started. My anxiety was terrible, but in the circulation became gradually restored, the different organs began to carry on their respective functions, and in an hour's time I was eating a hearty dinner. It cannot be said that I participated in this series, nor in the subsequent ones, with much verve, but after two ineffectual attempts of escape, I began to take quite an interest. Besides, I was becoming accustomed. My father was beside himself at his success, and as the months rolled by, his speculations took wilder and yet wilder flights. We ranged through the three great classes of poisons, the neurotics, the gaseous, and the irritants. 
but carefully avoided some of the mineral irritants and passed the whole group of corrosives. During the poison regime, I became quite accustomed to dying and had but one mishap to shake my growing confidence. Scarifying a number of lesser blood vessels in my arm, he introduced a minute quantity of that most frightful of poisons, the arrow poison, or curare. I lost consciousness at the start, quickly followed by the cessation of respiration and circulation, and so far had the solidification of the protoplasm advanced that he gave up all hope. But at the last moment he applied a discovery he had been working upon, receiving such encouragement as to redouble his efforts. In a glass vacuum, similar but not exactly like a crook's tube, was placed a magnetic field. When penetrated by polarized light, it gave no phenomena of phosphorescence nor the rectilinear projection of atoms, but emitted non-luminous rays similar to the X-ray. While the X-ray could reveal opaque objects hidden in dense mediums, this was possessed of far subtler penetration. By this he photographed my body, and found on the negative an infinite number of blurred shadows due to the chemical and electric motions still going on. This was an infallible proof that the rigor mortis in which I lay was not genuine, that is, those mysterious forces, those delicate bonds which held my soul to my body, were still in action. The resultants of all other poisons were unapparent, save those of mercurial compounds, which usually left me languid for several days. Another series of delightful experiments was with electricity. We verified Tesla's assertion that high currents were utterly harmless by passing 100,000 volts through my body. As this did not affect me, the current was reduced to 2,500, and I was quickly electrocuted. This time he ventured so far as to allow me to remain dead, or in a state of suspended vitality, for three days. It took four hours to bring me back. Once he superinduced lockjaw, but the agony of dying was so great that I positively refused to undergo similar experiments. The easiest deaths were by asphyxiation, such as drowning, strangling, and suffocation by gas, while those by morphine, opium, cocaine, and chloroform were not at all hard. Another time, after being suffocated, he kept me in cold storage for three months, not permitting me to freeze or decay. This was without my knowledge, and I was in a great fright on discovering the lapse of time. I became afraid of what it might do with me when I lay dead, my alarm being increased by the predilection he was beginning to betray towards vivisection. The last time I was resurrected, I discovered that he had been tampering with my breast. Though he had carefully dressed and sewed the incisions up, they were so severe that I had to take to my bed for some time. It was during this convalescence that I evolved the plan by which I ultimately escaped. While feigning unbounded enthusiasm in the work, I asked and received a vacation from my moribund occupation. During this period, I devoted myself to laboratory work, while he was too deep in the vivisection of the many animals captured by the blacks to take notice of my work. It was on these two propositions that I constructed my theory. First, electrolysis, or the decomposition of water into its constituent gases by means of electricity, and second, by the hypothetical existence of a force, the converse of gravitation, which Astor has named apogee, terrestrial attraction, for instance, merely draws objects together, but does not combine them. Hence, apogee is merely repulsion. Now, atomic or molecular attraction not only draws objects together, but integrates them. And it was the converse of this, 
or a disintegrative force, which I wished to not only discover and produce, but to direct at will. Thus, the molecules of hydrogen and oxygen reacting on each other separate and create new molecules containing both elements and forming water. Electrolysis causes these molecules to split up and resume their original condition, producing the two gases separately. The force I wish to find must not only do this with two, but with all elements, no matter in what compounds they exist. If I could then entice my father within its radius, he would be instantly disintegrated and sent flying to the four quarters, a mass of isolated elements. It must not be understood that this force, which I finally came to control, annihilated matter. It merely annihilated form. Nor, as I soon discovered, had it any effect on inorganic structure, but to all organic form it was absolutely fatal. This partially puzzled me at first, though I had stopped to think deeper, I would have seen through it. Since the number of atoms in organic molecules is far greater than in the most complex mineral molecules, organic compounds are characterized by their instability and the ease with which they are split up by physical forces and chemical reagents. By two powerful batteries, connected with magnets constructed specially for this purpose, two tremendous forces were projected. Considered apart from each other, they were perfectly harmless, but they accomplished their purpose by focusing at an invisible point in mid-air. After practically demonstrating its success, besides narrowly escaping being blown into nothingness, I laid my trap. Concealing the magnets, so that their force made the whole space of my chamber doorway a field of death, and placing by my couch a button by which I could throw on the current from the storage batteries, I climbed into bed. The blackies still guarded my sleeping quarters, one relieving the other at midnight. I turned on the current as soon as the first man arrived. Hardly had I begun to doze when I was aroused by a sharp metallic tinkle. There, on the mid-threshold, lay the collar of Dan, my father's St. Bernard. My keeper ran to pick it up. He disappeared like a gust of wind, his clothes falling to the floor in a heap. There was a slight whiff of ozone in the air, but since the principal gaseous components of his body were hydrogen, oxygen and nitrogen, which are equally colourless and odourless, there was no other manifestation of his departure. Yet, when I shut off the current and removed the garments, I found a deposit of carbon in the form of animal charcoal, also other powders, the isolated solid elements of his organism, such as sulphur, potassium and iron. Resetting the trap, I crawled back to bed, at midnight I got up and removed the remains of the second black, and then slept peacefully till morning. I was awakened by the strident voice of my father, who was calling to me from across the laboratory. I laughed to myself. There had been no one to call him, and he had overslept. I could hear him as he approached my room with the intention of rousing me, and so I sat up in bed the better to observe his translation. Perhaps apotheosis were a better term. He paused a moment at the threshold, then took the fatal step. Puff! It was like the wind sighing among the pines. He was gone. His clothes fell in a fantastic heap on the floor. Besides ozone, I noticed the faint garlic-like odour of phosphorus. A little pile of elementary solids lay among his garments. That was all. The wide world lay before me. My captors were no more.